been some undoubtedly shambolic signings in the history of the Premier League. The likes of Danny Drinkwater, Winston Bogard, Bebe. Who could possibly forget Bruno Sheru? Everybody. Not, probably not a single person that actually remembers. The names Savio and Serico may not really be known by anyone who isn't a West Ham fan or was unhealthily attached to Italian teams playing football manager 15 years ago. We get it. Go outside. He seemed as if he would promise a decent amount, but after failing to make an impact for the Hammers, going missing at multiple clubs, and then faking his own kidnapping, where did it all unravel for Savio? Now before we get into this video, this is a bit of an experimental one for myself. I've been wanting to do more storyline based content for a while now. But there are ridiculous things that have happened to ridiculous footballers in my time following the sport. And this is one that I don't feel is talked about too much. So if you go on to enjoy it, then feel free to slap a like on the video and of course subscribe if you're new to the channel. But anyway, let's wheel it back and let's start this actual story. Sabio and Seroko was born back in July of 1989, in the capital of of Uganda, Kampala. It's a city with a population of 1.6 million people, but in a Central African area that has always struggled from a footballing perspective. They've never qualified for a World Cup, and their best position in the African Cup of Nations is a runners-up medal back in 1978. But other than that, they've only ever got out of the group stages in that competition twice. Despite all of that though, and Savio himself was managing to make a name for himself in Europe at a young age. First of all, joining 1860 Munich in Germany in his youth years, before at the age of 16 being picked up by Italian Serie B side Brescia. There's not much in the way of stats for his youth career before moving to Europe because, I mean, unfortunately, the Ugandan Premier Division Under 15s League is not on Sky Sports. When will they work out that's a lucrative business prospect? He scored four goals in 23 appearances, which, as a winger, slash, you know, quite attacking player, it's not great. You're not going to set the world alight with that, but you're a useful squad player, especially at his age, which was between 16 and 19 at this point. But it wasn't his performances for his club that had people people interested. It would be the way in which he helped Germany, the side that he was now representing at youth level, win the under-19s European Championship in 2008. He actually only scored one goal in this entire tournament. Get ready for more stats like that because that's it's, it's not going to end, you know. But as a pretty skinny and gangly 18-year-old, he managed to score in their first group stage match against Spain before putting in some really, really good performances up until the final where Germany then beat Italy 3-0. He raised a trophy with his teammates and was even named in the team of the tournament. It had the likes of Bayern Munich and Juventus interested, but ultimately West Ham were the ones that would slap £9 million on the table. Now you've got to bear in mind this is 2009, so if you're spending £9 million on a player, you've got to know they're going to be pretty decent. For context, this was a club record signing for West Ham at the time. It was actually a pretty exciting time for West Ham. They were still being run by Icelandic owners, who I'm not going to pronounce because fam, it looks like I fell asleep on my keyboard. Board, which it turns out has since been implicated in the Panama Papers story, so... If I speak... But they were investing a decent amount in the side, they were chasing European football, and Gianfranco Zola was their manager. They just sold Craig Bellamy for £14 million, and they were ready to re-spend that money on a man who barely anyone knew when he'd only played 26 senior games, West Ham. Like, this had pain written all over it. Like, I've watched my team recruit Charlie Adams, Stuart Downing, Andy Carroll, and Milan Jovanovic within the space of a year. I don't even think... Milan Jovanovic was a real football player. He's 40 years old now, and he's just as good as he was back then. But people were interested and were excited to see how this relatively unknown talent was going to do. Scott Duxbury, the CEO of West Ham at the time, said he thought he was an incredible prospect, and that Gianfranco Zola would be extremely excited to start working with him. And he was almost guaranteed to get his big chance in the side. Because for some reason, I remember, I remember this time about West Ham a lot, but they had like a ridiculous amount of injuries. So they were playing a lot of youth prospects, a lot of players that have come through their youth academy. The likes of Zavon Hines, under-19s England international, Freddie Sears, Jack Collison, Junior Stanislaus and Josh Payne were all getting their chance in the team. So clearly their new club record signing was going to come in and get immediate first team football. But equally with a lack of first teamers and a lack of experience in the starting 11, combined with the fact that Savio was immediately given the number 10 shirt, which is beyond iconic at West Ham. We're talking Paolo Di Canio, Jeff Hurst, Sir Trevor Brookin, and even without taking into account the massive price tag for someone as inexperienced as him, the pressure was going to be enormous. His debut would come against Hull City. And did he blow people away? I mean, he only played three minutes, so it's hard to please in that time. Trust me, I would know. The problem is... 
That was the theme overall. In the space of six months, the German Ugandan winger played only 245 minutes for the club. He grabbed one start and one assist technically, although it was just a shot that was parried into the path of Jack Collison. And the reason he wasn't getting any game time was because he was struggling in training as well. According to one anonymous West Ham teammate who gave an interview with The Athletic, Gianfranco Zola would stay behind after training to help Savio with his crossing, but out of five crosses he put into the box, only one would be accurate. He said, I remember watching, thinking, fucking hell, this is our club record signing. On top of that, his new teammates had no idea who he was when he arrived. The only person who'd come across him at any point was current Colchester forward Freddie Sears in the under-19 setup for England. He was actually quite surprised that it didn't work out for Savio at West Ham, that it didn't click because he'd shown quite a lot of promise on the international stage. By all accounts, he was out of his depth, and some of his other teammates said that as well. Josh Payne, who I mentioned before, was kind of on the fringes of the West Ham side at the time, he'd just come through the academy, he played a few times under Zola. He said he was confused that Savio, their new club signing, was even training with the youngsters, but it became apparent that basically the only good training session he had was the night before a game at West Ham's ground. He said he showed promise, but then he was shit again after that. But at this point, we've got a young German under-19 international, German under-19 European champion, and he's struggling to put the performances both in training and out on the pitch. Enough youngsters come over to England and fail to adapt. But was he really that bad? I mean, he was, yeah, he was pretty shocking. There was two main problems, because as much as he was pretty pacey and actually technically decent on the ball, the kid had no decision-making skills whatsoever, especially in the final third. But on top of that, he also had no physicality at all. He was way too small, way too diminutive, didn't have any strength whatsoever. So as soon as any 50-50 happened, he'd just be shrugged off the ball. And especially in the Premier League, you're not going to make an impact if your diet is about one ham sandwich a day. But it wasn't just just his performances out on the pitch because he wasn't focused off it either. In an interview that he gave with German publication Build in 2013, he said that that was basically a turning point in his entire career going to West Ham. He spent far too much money on women, on clothes, on cars, and said that everything wrong I could do, I did. But again, you know, this has happened more than enough times with young players especially who were given a lot of money, have a lot of expectations. We've already talked about all the pressure really that came with this transfer. The problem is from this point on Onwards, his whole storyline and career just becomes an absolute shambles. It's now the summer of 2009. He's been at West Ham for about six months and he's played 10 times for the club. Pre-season training is well underway, but there is no sign of Savio. There's even rumours going around the changing room that he's gone missing. Nobody's heard from him whatsoever. The truth of the matter is he'd been sold to Italian side Fiorentina for £3 million. Pounds. I mean, financially, it's a shocking deal. Your club record signing, you sell six months later for a third of the fee. Somebody actually needs to investigate that whole transfer actually thinking about it. Get the FBI involved. Met Police. MI5. Power Rangers. I don't care. Just somebody sort it out. So now he's in Italy, right? He's in more familiar surroundings. You know, I think that was one thing that had been a problem for him in England. He hadn't really been able to adapt to the style of play and also the culture and he'd become quite quiet at the point around the changing room when he was leaving the club. So now he's back in Italy. It's all, it's all gonna be calm. It wasn't calm. He didn't play a single game for Fiorentina and pretty quickly he'd been loaned out to Bologna, who I believe were in the second division at the time. So now he's in even more familiar surroundings, you know? Now he's in a league that he's played in. He made two appearances for them and didn't score a goal. So Bologna weren't happy with his performances. They cancelled the loan. But now even better, Fiorentina loaned him to 1860 Munich, a club that he'd spent some time with during his youth training. So now it's even more familiar surroundings. He's at a club that he's been to before. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut out the shit. He, he, he was terrible there as well. He played two games for them. He, he was terrible for 1860 Munich too. In fact, his loan spell there was cut short after a couple of months because he went AWOL and just didn't turn up to training for a week, only to be discovered staying at his sister's house. Uh, understandably, the club were not happy and shipped him back to Fiorentina. So in January 2011, he was back out on loan again, this time in Bulgaria playing for Chernomorets. He got 11 appearances for them, and I'll warn you, this was the only time he played more than twice at a loan spell in this four-year year period. Next up, he was at Juve Stabia in Serie C. He played one game, then went AWOL again. After that, he took a trip to Romania, playing for Vaslui, and he signed for Unterhaching in Germany on a permanent deal. That deal lasted two months after a breach of contract. He then signed for Victoria Köln in the German Regional Leagues, FC Atrau in the Kazakhstani Premier League, Veroy in Bulgaria, Biatava in Lithuania, Pippinsried in Germany, and Vorea in Bulgaria, before eventually settling in German regional football at Ar 
Farm in München. The long and short of it is he's been at 16 football clubs since leaving West Ham in 2009. And between 09 and 2018, he scored one professional goal. This man's career spiralled out of control on the pitch and off it. He was accused of stealing the watch of a teammate whilst playing for Unterharking. But quite possibly the weirdest story I've ever seen or ever heard of a footballer being involved in. And certainly the weirdest story to come out of his career following on from his move away from West Ham was where in 2012 he allegedly faked his own kidnapping in an attempt to extort money from his own family. What the fucking hell damn it? It's been a good one, lads. Like and subscribe. How do you sit down at Christmas dinner after this ordeal? Yeah, look, mom, sorry I tried to uh, defraud you earlier on in the year, but if you could just pass me the turkey. So a little bit more detail on this one. It happened when he was 23. I basically allegedly made a call back to his parents whilst away in Thailand, insinuating that he'd been kidnapped by locals and they were demanding a ransom of 3,000 euros or 2,400 pounds. The hope was that that his family would send him money in exchange for his safe release by these so-called captors. But apparently the whole thing was a hoax. He did deny that this happened in an interview with Build in 2013, but did at least say that this point in his life was a moment of clarity and a point that he couldn't continue living like he was. He did enjoy an upturn in form like lower down in the regional leagues in Germany, but for a man who has an under-19 European Championship winner's medal and was featured in the team of the tournament playing for Germany there, it's nowhere near what he should have achieved in the game. So at a point where we can reflect on his overall story, which is, if I'm gonna be honest, absolutely fucking tapped. First of all, where is he now? Well, having played at the lower leagues of German football, he's actually now coaching there as well. He was both a player and assistant coach at a side called BSC Sendling, but has since returned to FC Unterhaken, where he had a spell in the mid-teens. And by all accounts, those at the club, he's a pretty sound lad, and he's doing a good job coaching there. And it begs the question, really and truly, was he that bad? I mean, it's fair to say his career took a weird, weird turn, but as a footballer, he wasn't that bad. He may have only scored one goal during his journeyman period, but it was an absolute screamer. The kid clearly had a decent amount of talent, it just wasn't shown consistently. The main reason this conversation is even happening is because of some of the stuff that he did off the pitch after playing for West Ham, and the fact that he was a club record fee, but he can't control the amount of money that was paid for him. Ultimately, the pressure of being a club record player, wearing that number 10 shirt, playing in a side that was very youth oriented because of injuries at the time, and just not being a physical build to compete and perform well in the English Premier League, meant that he was never going to reach his potential in that side. It's a shame that he then made further moves that were terrible for his career and then just didn't turn up for training. Ideally, he should have been doing that if, if we're going to look back in retrospect. But there have been far worse worst players in the history of football and far worse players in the history of the Premier League. As mentioned by his former teammate Freddie Sears, there was clearly something about him. There was a definite spark that could have led to a pretty solid career, either in England or back in Germany or Italy. His career probably didn't go the way he envisaged it would from a young age, but not many players get to represent their country at any level, let alone win silverware with that nation. And as he embarks on his new coaching career, I'm sure he'll have some wise words to tell the youngsters of the next German generation generation. Predominantly, go to training. Please do that, just at, at the very least. If you enjoyed this video though, feel free to slap a like on it, and of course subscribe if you're new to the channel. Let me know what you thought about the video down in the comment section below. If you've got any ideas for further storytelling videos, then drop them down there as well. But it's been a pleasure ranting at you guys today. Have a wonderful day, enjoy yourselves, and goodbye.